Okay, so uh, if everyone's warmed up. Ooh. Okay, so uh, afternoon everyone. Um, so my name is Wei Ting. Uh, I'm actually a um, software engineer at Ministry of Education Singapore. So we build apps for schools to help them teach better. So today I'm going to talk a bit about meta programming. Um, so first I think I want to talk a bit about why, why I want to talk about this, right? So, so um, I wasn't a computer science student and three years ago actually I got a job as a software engineer. So of course the first thing you do is to write code. And this was my face when I was reading um, Rails, Rails apps code, right? So I don't, I don't really get what's going on. Uh, the next best thing you do is just copy what's existing, modify a bit, and then submit a pull request and pray, <laughs> correct? So over the last three years, um, um, there have been some very nice things that, that have gone my way, a uh, very helpful team. Um, one of the other things that happened was also that um, the team that I worked on actually circulated a book, uh, so Meta Programming Ruby, right? And um, so at that point of time, it wasn't a priority for me. I took one year to finish this book, right? So that's my where, where my priorities are. Uh, but in fact, over this one year, I think after reading through and, and rethinking about things, I learned a bit more about Ruby, right? It's, it's quite similar to how uh, Jin Qi uh, read, read through the Ruby so uh, the C source code, but. For me, reading through the concepts in a, in a story-like manner is more palatable, right? And six months ago, I actually attended uh, the Ruby SG meetup, and Dragos was down there trying to give a talk about submitting a call for proposal. So I was sitting down there thinking about whether I should try for something like that, and six months later, here I am. Right, so this is my first talk for in the Ruby test. So, Dragos, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so I think the other thing that I realized is that um, for meta programming is, um, for me, if I don't do it, do it deliberately, uh, it comes in bits and pieces as intuition. So what I want to do is to try to actually identify certain key tips or concepts and hope that um, both the, the junior developers and the senior developers can also pick up some of this and at least um, benefit and teach the team as and when you can. So today I'm going to talk about uh, why we do meta programming some tips and um, how not to get, get yourself killed while doing metaprogramming. Okay, so uh, let's first start with the definition of metaprogramming. So uh, Google reviews many, uh, many kinds of definitions. Um, the one I like, I really like is code that writes more code. Uh, but the more accurate version of this is actually the writing of programs that write or manipulate, blah, blah, blah. So what it means is that if you, as you, as of now, we write Ruby methods which accept data and we give an output to that. So metaprogramming means that you accept the program that you have written as a piece of data or an object and you modify it. So what you are doing is you are inherently modifying the application behavior at runtime. Everyone got that? Okay. So the next question is that, oh, this is such a complex concept. So why do you ever met metaprogram in the first place, right? Um, so what I will try to do here is to convince you that it is sometimes better to meta program, and I will try to show some examples. So we start with a very easy one. Um, suppose I need, I have an object called A, and I need to define uh, the standard getters and setters. So the most, the easiest way to do this is just to define the Ruby methods as follows. So you just have a equals get and set, correct? Uh, so this is quite a few lines, and actually what happens is that um, you can actually rewrite this in a, in a nicer and cleaner way by using Attribute Assessor, right? So I think everyone's very familiar with Attribute Assessor, um, and if you want a very naive implementation of this, this is how it's going to look like, right? But overall what you have is that you have actually abstracted some of the logic away, right? So develop, when developers read class A, they instantly understand what full and bar actually mean to the class, right? So one of, uh, one of the benefits of meta programming is actually that you get slightly more readable and concise code in the class methods, in the class definitions. Okay, so um, another example uh, would be on why to meta program is that in certain cases we have, uh, we might want to extend this attribute assessor even further. So I guess, how many of y'all use Rails here? Many of y'all. So if you actually include um, active record base in this manner, you realize that Rails actually includes all the attributes for you. 
you do not even need to de define them. And, and if you, as you dig into the code, you realize that, oh, what Rails does is that it actually digs into the, the schema, the, the database schema. It identifies this, uh, the set of um, attributes that this model has, and then it populates that. Right? And, and so what this does is that it gives you um, very automatic behavior. And when you define active record classes, these are things that uh, would help you along the way. So you don't have to spend a lot of time writing it. You don't really need to read it because all these uh, columns are actually listed in the schema, schema, and actually all the developers are aware of this. Okay, so another, another uh, value of meta programming is the following. So suppose we have a report model, and, and this report um, requires three states. So you have a draft, a reviewing, and a published state, and then you want to transition between the different states. So what you have is uh, you want code that looks like that on the left, everyone can see. Um, so you have a state, you create a new report, it is in draft state. What I can do is that I can try to submit it, it moves into reviewing state and so on and so forth. So it's like a state machine. Right? So again, a naive implementation of this would be to just code out the methods as we can. Right? But what happens is that as business requirements change, you start to introduce a lot more things. So for example, the boss comes to you and says, no, I think three states is not enough. Um, we might want to have five states. You know? So what you can then do is to go back to the class, redefine, write even more methods. But if you look at it carefully, um, okay, so again, um, so what can also happen is that the boss could also ask you for things like, um, you know, I want pre and post transition hooks. So for example, if I, if I were to submit a report, can I actually send an email out to everyone to just notify them of this? and so on and so forth, right? You want to raise errors. Uh, so some of these are very common, repeatable logic. So what you can then do is to actually meta-program this, right? For example, if you can actually define the states and the transitions programmatically, right? Then what happens is that you can actually write code to actually generate these methods for you automatically. And the hooks in there will be a lot easier. So what I'm going to do here is that I've actually copied um, what a gem called Workflow has done. So what Workflow does is that it wraps up all this logic into a very nice DSL, um, as you can see. So what you will have is that you define the initial state. Let me try to have the laser pointer up and running. Okay, never mind. Um, so what you have is that you define states, uh, draft, reviewing, and publish, and then you define transitions between them. What you get here is that um, who agrees that this code is more readable for everyone? So I think it's, it's beautiful, the way, you know, because when currently we only have three states. If you have 10 states and 20 transitions between the 10 states, this will look a lot more readable than, than having probably about 20 times, about 100 or 200 methods in there. Right, so what, what you then do with meta programming is then uh, with this. So what you do is that you define domain-specific domain languages, and then you then hide the logic elsewhere. Right? So this is definitely re readable, concise, and of course more reusable. So now you can take this workflow um, DSL, and you can actually bring it to other models and reuse it. So just to sum up, I think um, these are just some of the very basic examples of why meta programming will help you. So uh, they are more dynamic. They provide dynamic behavior, it's readable, concise, you don't really repeat yourself. But I think all in all, um, it provides code that's a lot more readable. I'm sure all of you know that reading code that's not done by you is actually quite painful, right? So the more readable it is, the less pain you feel. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give three tips to, to start meta programming. So uh, the first is, what Jinti has covered. So when I saw a talk, I was quite happy. Um, but essentially what you need to do is, um, because for meta programming, what you are trying to do is to modify the behavior. In essence, you are trying to modify the behavior of the object or the class. So it is very important for you to get your mental model right. So if you are to define classes, include classes, subclass, and, and so on and so forth, create objects, right? You must be very clear on what you are creating and what you're observing. So this is, really ugly, but you get the idea. So 
the first important thing is actually for, for people who want to mental program is to get this mental model right. If you don't get this right, it's very hard for you to implement uh, proper code in the mental programming sense. Okay. Uh, the second step to, to actually doing mental programming is to learn how to modify the behavior. Um, a, sub, a sub point of this is actually to understand how Ruby is evaluated. So things like how are methods being called, um, how, do, how do messages pass between the objects, right? What is, um, how do they catch missing methods and things like that, right? So a very good start for me, I feel, is that um, you should read the core Ruby docs. Um, I would like to point to a few, a few sets of functions that I think are quite useful for everyone. So um, if you do need to understand a class, so you, if you need to understand a class, you can use uh, methods like instance variable, get the methods, what are the instance methods, singleton methods, class and single class. And if you need, and once you have, if you need to understand this and you need to modify the behavior of it, then you can go on to the methods on the right. So these are things like um, defining method. So you can programmatically define new methods. You can add methods, or you can even uh, undefine methods, right? So just a trivia for those who are uh, quite experienced. Um, these, these methods are defined in very different parts of Ruby. So you need to do some hunting if you want to find them. Okay. Uh, the last thing is, is that if for you to do blender programming is to actually uh, figure out what's the DSL that you want. So um, I can't really give much advice here because it's very contextual, depends on the team. But uh, what I've learned is that the first copy is never the best. You can always iterate to get uh, slightly better DSLs, more readable code. And um, what I would suggest is actually that you copy from others. So I think Rails has very good implementations. You can look through. It is very, very complex, um, even for their attribute assessor definitions. But you can, looking through some of these libraries will give you an idea of how the DSLs are done and how they're implemented. OK, so um, the problem with meta programming is that if you can modify behavior, uh, you can uh, knowingly, you can also modify behavior unknowingly. Right? And that's where it gets very dangerous. Right? So simple things like that can happen. Um, I have been caught many times where um, my, my teammates have written code hidden in a, in a very small folder somewhere, and it, uh, which results in very implicit behavior, which I don't recognize. So it takes me a few hours to debug, which is quite nasty. Right? So I'm going to go through three, three big things. Uh, so some of the gotchas. So I think the first thing is, um, as you meta program, try to keep the meta programming code independent. So if you do modify a class or you modify an object, please try to keep it towards that object and not, and not um, introduce more dependencies. Right? The second thing is uh, don't meta program meta programming code. So what, what can happen is that you can have a set of defined methods that look very similar and go, oh, why not? Let me just group them together, and then I can do meta-meta programming, right? Um, the issue I have with this is that um, if you remember reading the meta programming code, um, it is actually very hard to read meta programming code in itself. There's actually an extra load on your head to try to figure out what's going on, what you are creating, what you're modifying. So try not to make it even more unreadable, unless necessary. Yeah. The third thing I want to say is actually that uh, you know more is not always good. Um, after this talk, I, I don't think it's right to just go and say, let's go meta program everything. Right? So um, imagine the following case where you have a class and you have 20 includes on the, in front of the, after, just after you define the class. So if you, if you encounter a bug, it's very hard for you to identify which piece of code actually defines this behavior or modifies this behavior. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is readability. So I have kind of shown you um, ways in which meta programming can help in readability. Uh, but there are also cases where it might not help so much. So let me give an example. Um, I actually found this code online. Uh, it's from this gem called REST client. So we have on the left a meta programming uh, kind of example. And we have on the right a more explicit example. Right, so who, who prefers the meta programming way? And who prefers 
the right side, the more explicit example. Okay, so from those who raise their hands, actually, so this, this is a very interesting question. I presented this to my team. I, I also got kind of a half-half. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it boils down to uh, the team's composition, and it's, it's about what the team feels, right? Certain, certain people, if you have a team that has um, very experienced developers who are, in this, who are working on the same app for a very long time, it is okay to have more metaprogramming code versus a team which has more turnover or prototype app. Maybe explicit is much better. It's, it's a lot easier to get that up to speed. So, um, so yeah, what I want to say here is that short is not always readable, right? And sometimes at, at some point you have to choose between whether you want more implicit or more explicit behavior. Okay, the last thing to note is uh, always remember to document and test. Uh, because meta programming is quite hard to read, uh, it's very important to actually explain what you're trying to do, right? Um, so I, yeah, I, I think uh, we, we all understand this. If you have done a lot of Rails, you should know that you are, you are using a lot of meta programming in there, uh, before actions, after actions, all the callbacks and things like that. So the documentation helps a lot in identifying what you actually want to do. Uh, the other thing is also to write tests. So when you introduce some meta programming code, right, um, it, it, when, when you write a test, it also got, it got, number one, it guards against your behavior, so you can commit with confidence. Uh, it's also important for you to um, write it so that you kind of tell readers what you are intending to do with this piece of meta programming code. So if, if you see the test below here, you, you can actually tell if, um, you can actually tell like the behavior that you are trying to, to bring out in this particular model, right? And so it's, it's for people who don't like, really like to read documentation and if they prefer to read tests, this is a much better platform for them. Okay, so I think all in all, um, I, would, I just want to say that actually meta programming is still a tool, so it's not really a silver bullet for everybody, uh, but in certain cases it does work wonders and it's quite magical when the code, when the code you have reflected is, is a lot more readable. Right? So uh, I just want to share that also be aware of some of the risks that this might have. Right? So when you have, when you have a lot of meta programming, there's a lot of implicit behavior. It's hard to debug. In fact, it also takes a long time to actually design it and to build this. Okay, so if everyone has enjoyed this, um, I hope you did, but, and if you want to look more into it, um, I can introduce you to this book. Um, in the book, they will, they will go more detail into some of the possible uh, spells or design patterns that you can use. And I hope part of this answers Jin uh, Chi's why. So, so we get more readable code. <laughs> okay, so uh, if that's all then I think, um, Thank you everybody for listening and not falling asleep. Uh, yeah, and any questions if, if possible. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yes, so we take questions now. Um, anyone? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the cameo. Um, basically, my feeling about meta programming is that you say it makes more readable code, but in a way it seems like you're just shifting the readability to, it makes it readable for the user of the API, but you, are sh the, you have extra additional complexity in where the code is being written, which is why Rails is so easy for beginners to pick up, but it's so magical. So like, how do you actually integrate uh, the meta programming part of your application into your project? Do you, do you manage it as like a separate you know, you know, library? Or how does it? Uh, okay, so, Mm, how do we do it? Okay, so, uh, okay, actually, I have the slides. Let me check. Uh. Okay, I think, yeah, I was, I was actually working on this example to just try to show some examples of it. Uh. So, um, for example, in, in our app, actually, we have uh, many, many models. Um, and suppose in, in one of these models, you want to attach, okay, certain models have files. Like reports have maybe have, they have pictures, right? And you have articles which has many pictures, and these things have attachments, right? So one way of doing it is the following, where you can define it. Uh, so it's, it's still part of the application code, right? Uh, but it's hidden off in a... Where did I hit it? Uh? I think we keep it, we keep it separate. 
Okay, in the app, but separate from the rest of the models. And then we just test that. Yeah. So I agree with you that, yes, it does, it does hide some of the uh, complexity um, away. But so that's why I think if you have tested that properly, I think it's fine. So yeah, I think, I think that would be the, the, the easiest way to answer that. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was curious to know, you mentioned that um, depending on certain teams, metaprogramming might be a wise choice and sometimes not. Yes. Um, so I was curious to know, in your own team, how do you determine whether something um, is a good candidate to be metaprogrammed and when it should not be? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, for us, what happens is that um, when the best kinds of candidates are those where you find yourself repeating the same, the same things over and over again. Um, so for, for this example of attachments, right, we actually had this, um, we had to repeat this in probably about 20 or 30 models. And I think that was when it, it made more sense to actually uh, do meta programming on this, right? Um, for things that are very well defined and the behavior is understood already, you should do this. Um, for things that are very unclear, because the design, the design portion takes quite a long time to do, right? to come up with the DSL and to implement it. So for unclear requirements, it is better not to involve too much of metaprogramming. Right? So, um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Hey, I was wondering what's your approach to method missing? Because all of these examples that you've shown here were like defined methods, so this is pretty safe meta programming. As yes. you're, you're you're defining some some method, and you know that this method will be there. Yes. Uh, method missing is like you know the double edged sword that there is you 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 call it whenever the method doesn't exist. So I was wondering if you think that yes. it is uh, it is recommended by you to use this approach, or you should be extremely careful and use it only when you have no other choice or I see. extremely uh, rarely. Yeah. Okay. So I I did want to talk about meta method missing. Um, there was an anti pattern on it online, um, but I think, I think it got too much into details. But for me, if you, if you ask me, um, if you can avoid method missing, you should avoid method missing at all costs. Right? Um, because method missing is, uh, is, I would see as a global catch all for all, all missing methods. Uh, but to implement that correctly, you need to also implement um, a respond to missing, if I remember correctly because that will identify whether a method is actually missing or not. So you can implement, uh, you can catch some of these missing methods, but Ruby doesn't know that this method is missing or not. And so that, that's why I think you have to understand the object model a little more to, and, and see how the message passes. Yeah, so if, if you can, you should avoid it. But always good to understand and know how method missing is implemented. One more question. Do you have any favorite DSL out there in the open source, some that you particularly like, how readable it is? DSL. So I think um, I, I really like Workflow because I think we have about, uh, we deal with about four in our, OK, so the app that I work on is actually a, um, like an assessment app. So we have answers and which has four, four or five states. And actually, they can rotate between each other. So actually, the workflow DSL is a very nice example. Um, there was one more recently that I came in contact with, which I really liked, um, which was uh, it had to do with some passing. I forget. Uh, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't answer that now. But Just tweet yeah. later when you, yeah. when you remember, you know, OK? You know. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Hi, any more? Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, for the example of uh, the HTTP actions and metaprogramming, yes. Uh, what would your approach to testing the methods defined in the uh, public API? Would you just do separate tests for defining the explicit method, like have a test for get, put, post, and delete, or 
test one test one of the possible verbs if they exist uh what what do you do usually when you meta program like public ah, methods in the in objects okay so um okay there are different uh, examples um so okay for this case what i might do is actually to uh swap, swap out the possible verbs with just one verb um let the let the let the file run and see if r is executed r receives the the method call so something like that for the workflow one where it's a bit slightly different i probably have a concrete like so i have a dummy class i include some workflows define the methods uh, define the workflow and states and transitions there and then i just test uh, test that all right uh, that thanks answer. yep Is there more? We can take one more question before we move on. No? Okay. Thank you very much, Wei Ching. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause.